All right, what's up, party people? It is your boy BQ. We're talking NWA once again. NWA Power on a Saturday morning. This is the Power Moves podcast. How we do it each and every week, giving the NWA a little bit of love here on the most negative channel in the world. So we're gonna get into this one. This probably wasn't my favorite episode in the world. Um, we've probably gone about four weeks now without a women's match, and the women's matches are always really good so it's it's kind of like the way i see it these episodes always seem to kick off with something that's like really too indie for my taste and i feel like if you sandwich a women's match with one of these like indie matches and then a good main event i think that would improve the shows quite a bit but uh what do i know just a fan just a podcaster just giving my thoughts on the national wrestling alliance so if it's your first time here, this is a TNA centric channel, uh, but I do review power each week. Um, most most of my viewers are not like super into it, but I'm just kind of doing my part to talk NWA because there's not a lot of people out there, and um, I enjoy the product. I don't. I really try not to overthink it when I'm watching it. Like when I watch Impact, I over the th- overthink the absolute shit out of it, or I just maybe not overthink it, but I just overanalyze the hell out of it. Try not to do that so much that so much of that with power because they do accomplish uh, some of the things I'm looking for when I'm watching wrestling. A lot of the smaller details they do, smaller details that I like, smaller details that I notice, you know. So I don't have quite as many complaints, but I do think there's a lot of room for improvement. So I am your boy BQ. Let's get into this. This episode is going to have a main event of Mims and Zion, which I had interest in. Uh, they did a good job of the video package. And that's really all I had interest in when they announced the uh, the lineup for the show. And it, this is this is kind of a couple weeks now that um, I haven't had a lot of interest in, in what they're doing to kick off the show. So the first match here is uh, this is an NWA Crockett Cup play-in. And it is Cheese. That's right. His name is Cheese. A little known fact about BQ, the number one thing I hate in this world is cheese. And I get it all the time. How can you not like cheese? How can you not eat cheese? That's un-American. I've never known anyone who doesn't eat cheese. I hate cheese. Hate, hate, hate it. Um, So the Cheese and Mike Orlando take on the Heavenly Butterflies. Um. I don't have a lot to say about this. I didn't really enjoy it. Mike Orlando does some pretty good work. He's done some NWA stuff. You know, they usually find a way to use him and Ali Rex when they come and do the Sarasota, Sarasota Florida shows. Uh, I think they call this the power station. I always forget, but when, when they're there, it's a very nice setup. Mike Orlando does some pretty decent work, but um, overall, this was like two... Too bingo hall for me. This guy cheese cannot work. His work look like shit. I'm not a wrestler, so I mean, who am I to sit here and? But I know what looks good on screen and what doesn't. Um, I mean, you're talking elbow drops, simple moves, simple simple moves just really look like crap. Um, but they won. The cheese and Mike Orlando won. So this is a play in from what I understood. From what I understood. The winner of that faces the winner of the next match, and that's going to be the 16th seed. Uh, I really hope these guys are not in the tournament. I'm pretty sure they're not going to be, but um, this didn't really do it for me. Like I said, Mike Orlando can do some things, but um, the cheese, the heavenly butterflies, not for me. Not for me. Then we get into Knox and Murdoch talking about the Crockett Cup. They're going to be in the finals of this thing. Let me just fucking throw that out there. Um, well, you know what? I'm not going to say the finals. They will be in the semis. So they're probably going to be in the finals. But there's a chance I think Jax and Jax Dane and Tim Storm could be there. So it's it's going to, on that side of the bracket, that is. So uh, usually when you have people interviewed and talking about it, they're probably going to be there, you know, in the end. And then we get, um, this was probably the best part of the show, to be honest. Uh, well, Tom Latimer and um, Kenzie Page. I don't really like Tom's promos, his voice. That's just me personally. But 
Uh, him and Kenzie Page, who has been missing in action from the TV in about a month, are talking about the Crockett Cup and give the 16 seeds. So I'm going to run through them like real, real quick here for you guys. I had it on my screen, and of course it closed out. And I may do another upload getting a little deeper into these later. I, I don't know. We'll see. But um, I'm not going to be super dramatic about it like they were. Uh, the left side of the, the bracket is Split Force Trauma is number one. They're going to take on the the uh, playing team, which is going to be the winner of the of, of Mike Orlando and the Cheese versus, um, I think, the Spectaculars. Number eight, um, the Fixers. They're Indie Outlaw. They take on Max and Jadias. Yeah, I will do an upload on this later because I'm going to give my my predictions. And then, uh, so Fixers are number eight, Max and Jadias number nine. Number four, Immortals are going to take on number 13, Kids. Number five, uh, the Kids are also Indie Outlaw. Uh, number five, Daisy Kill and Talos, Indie Outlaw versus number 12, the Stew Crew. I don't remember who those guys are at the moment. I'm going to say Indie. Um, and then on the other side, the the bracket, we got Knox and Murdoch, number two. Uh, Miserably Faithful, number 15. Jack Storm, I mean, excuse me, Jack's Dane and Tim Storm are number seven. Against number 10, Looks That Kill, which is crazy. Is there's two females in this thing, uh, Maxi Impaler and Natalia Markova. And then number three, the Southern Six take on number 14, the Bingo Hall Balls. Um, I mean, the Slime Balls. And then number six, Samoa versus number seven, uh, Country Gentleman. Is that how they say their name? Not not really a fan, so I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. So uh, I'll do something separate on that. I'm going to give... I'm probably going to do something separate. I'm not. I'm not going to marry myself to that comment, but um, I got to. I got to think about those a little bit. You know, think about who's in it and give my thoughts and predictions. So then it shows afterwards. You know, Knox and Murdoch upset they weren't number number one. Of course, you're not number one. Blunt Force Trauma has been running through teams for how long now? They're the champions. They're number one. I mean. Come on, the Immortals sitting here. We should have been number one. No, you should have fucking not. I think they were number four. Knox Murdoch number two. It's not that serious. But I do, I do got to say, I appreciate them having seating because really these days in wrestling, they'll throw tournaments together and you'll see uh, one side that's much heavier than the other. And the, the seating just doesn't make sense. You know, so at least here they try to make it make sense. So, um, I'm cool with that because they they want to give you that NCAA feel like, hey, there, there could be an upset. There could be, um, you know, a high seed knocked out in the first round. And like they want to paint that picture for you. So they do a pretty good job with that. And then we get the Spectaculars, uh, Brady Pierce and Slade with Rolando Freeman. And they take on, these are real names, Kai Price and Cam Fox. You know who won this match, the Spectacular. So they're going to take on. From what I'm understanding, the Cheese and Mike Orlando, they're going to beat those guys too. I got to give a lot of props though because the majority of these teams are part of the roster in one way, shape, or form. They might be part of Exodus Pro or whatever, but in one way, shape, or form, like they're part of the NWA family. And, um, you know, God bless TNA. Like they can't put on an eight team or eight person tournament without bringing someone in, you know? So, um, I do give them props for just having a large enough roster to make this work and to make this make sense. And then the NWA champion Queen Bees are talking. Uh, they're, they're, they hope that there's an all-females Crockett Cup one day. I don't know if that's going to happen because Billy Corgan has even gone on record to, to say he can't even do an NWA Empower too. So I have a hard time thinking he can put the teams together. Now, They've done a pretty good job in the NWA as far as a women's tag team division. Like they've made it work. They've made it work far better than TNA has. But a Crockett Cup, I mean, maybe if you're doing eight teams, you could probably pull it off, but you'd you'd be pulling from the absolute depths of the indies that try to put a 16 team women women's team together. Now I, I know there's a lot more. In a sense, there's a lot more women out there because there's less slots on TV and less slots on these companies. So you would think, hey, the indies have more to more to offer. So I guess that's a possibility. But man, that that 
I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around that one. That would be um, a pretty tough one. But they are also pointing out that Markova and Maxi and Paler are in this thing. They can get away with it. I, I don't mind a little intergender stuff. I know some people are very bothered by that. The wrestlers can do it. We can live with it. Then they do a video package highlighting the um, NWA's return to the territory system. So when they announced this initially, that they were going to be partnering uh, with small independent companies and kind of creating a territory system, you know, uh, the people who don't watch the show, don't follow the company, clown the shit out of this. But as far as, you know, us who watch it, why not? It's a cool idea. It's different. They're, they're taking a chance. You know, how can you knock someone for taking a chance? Are these the hottest independent promotions in the world? Probably not. But it gives them an opportunity to plenish the roster, pull out some talent early. You know, you know what I'm saying? So I can live with it. And they're giving the dates of the next um, next three events or each of each of the territories um, next event. You know what I'm saying? So I, th- I think it's a cool concept. I just. I can do with the with, you know without the slime balls and and who's the guy they had with the sweater around his neck. I can do a little less with that, but you know I, I'm gonna trust <laughs> trust the process that they got going on here. And then the main event of this show is Zion um, with what the fuck is his name Austin Idol, who annoys the just absolute piss out of me. I thought they were going to fire him on the show a couple weeks ago. I was down for it. I just, I, I cannot do. When Austin Idol was on commentary with, um, with, uh, let's say Sky Blue, with Velvet Sky, I mean, just the most cringe work in professional wrestling. The most cringe, absolute cringe commentary. Like, I could not get through those episodes. Thank God that that is not a thing anymore. That is not a pairing. And just thank God we're just not getting Austin Idol. Maybe some of you guys like him. He he just annoys the absolute freaking piss out of me. And maybe that's what he's going for because he's a heel manager. And maybe it's modern day wrestling and we shouldn't be annoyed. We should just say, hey, this person's a good heel. But he does annoy me. So he takes on Mims. Um, and the winner's going to take on Tom Latimer at the Crockett Cup. So I was saying that when they had the... the, the um, the national championship match. I wanted to see Blake Troop win, which they didn't follow up on that this week at all. I I would have liked a little bit of a follow-up, but I get it. They try to focus on who's on the card. So that that, that's fine. But um, I wanted to see Blake Troop win that thing. I think that would have been just something new and different. And, uh, you know, you buy him as a legit badass. Tom Latimer feels so, I guess this is the first time holding the title. I could have sworn he's had it before. But it just feels so been there, done that with him. I was kind of enjoying him being off TV for a little bit. I don't I don't know what it is that he's just not my favorite wrestler in the world. But I was kind of disappointed that he, he won. Um, so this was kind of a one-match episode. They have been lately. But the the way I always explain my wrestling fandom is I don't care a whole lot about what goes on in the match as far as the moves. Like, you're not going to wow me with 50 million flips and all that. I, I, I prefer more of a story. But I care about who wins and loses. That That is the way that I watch wrestling, whether it's TNA, NWA, whatever. I care a lot about who wins and loses. I care a lot about momentum. And things that kind of are, are logical. So Mims has this whole storyline where he is he's turning heel. He, he's he's gone rogue. Um, there is a little bit of a story that he gets likes to put his hands on managers, and that's what costs him matches. But I'm, I mean, he's a heel now, and he should be establishing that character and that role. And that's not what they're doing. They put him in this match with Zion, another heel. And the commentators, bless their heart, EC3 is on commentary. They're trying to they're trying to te- treat Mims like a heel, but then they're also the crowd is also cheering for him because there's two bad guys in a the match. They're not going to cheer for Zion. I promise you that. 
so then they start having, having to sell him as a baby face and the crowd getting behind him. And it doesn't make any sense. The cliffhanger from an episode or two ago was that he turned heel at the very end. And then you put him in this match, this number one contenders match. He's already lost twice versus Maxian Paler, which is crazy. But you put him in this number one contenders match, and he doesn't even win it. Like, how does that how does he have any momentum from that heel turn now? And um, you know, Magnum Muscle ex- implodes, explodes, I should say. What's what's next for that? Like it's it's I don't think they tied tied the story together well enough from the previous episode. You know, I just felt like this was a whole different, this was a different set of tapings, but it just felt like just a different, I don't even know how to explain it. So Mims takes on Zion and the match is okay. I mean, I cared about it. I cared about who, who won, who lost. So I was into it. It wasn't, you know, a Matt classic, but I was into it. And then Zion wins with a freaking submission, the C whatever. And I'm sitting here like, not only did Mims lose this thing, but he taps out. Or they put him to sleep or whatever. I think it was a tap out. Like, I I don't get it. Like, for me, personally, as a fan, Mims, as a TV champion, could have done his seven defenses and had a pretty big match against EC3 because this is the dude that I really think is going to be one of the major players in the company in a year or two. It doesn't mean I can't see him wrestle somewhere else. But he feels like it feels like NWA is his home and he can make that work. And he would he would probably see higher levels of success staying there than trying to go somewhere else. He's had a lot of character progression from the beginning. He's starting to be able to talk really well. And it just seems like this is the one of the guys you should really get behind. And there's a heel versus heel match. There's there's no continuation, continuity from when he turned heel on Dak Draper. It, it'd be one thing, dude, if Dak Draper came and cost him the match. Like it was it was just so weird. And then he just loses in a tap out victory in the end. And that's it. Zion's gonna be a number one contender. Zion's undefeated, I believe. I think people would have had more interest in Mims and him possibly winning that championship too, because it would have made sense. He dropped the TV title to a girl. So why not put the national championship on him? It was a weird episode for me. Kind of let, left a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth, but, but we'll see, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to learn not to jump co- to conclusions, whether it's NWA or TNA. I'm trying not to uh, get on my head of myself too much, even though it's, human nature it's just natural behavior to do that when you see questionable booking but for me the question the booking for mims has been questionable all of 2024 once he did that heel turn i'm like now it all makes sense and then it's just like he goes backwards so i'm not i'm not getting it i'm not understanding it but he's got a lot of talent and he's he's going to be one of those dudes at some point um but i think the money is with him and ec3 one day and it's just they're just not going there and then EC3 at the end lets you know what the Crockett Cup um, is going to be facing Sam Adonis, the dream match, right? So uh, Sam Adonis will be challenging for the championship there. He did a good job of putting him over, though. You know, instead of us saying, who the fuck is that? I mean, I know who he is, but instead of just people say, oh, what a random match. I mean, he did a good job putting it over. So, And it was good to get EC3 on the show, even for a little bit. Champ should always have. A little bit of time. I always thought Nick Aldis was really overexposed on the show. Like at first it was like, oh man, I can't picture this show without him. And then it was like, okay, dude, this dude's cutting a promo on every freaking episode. You know what I'm saying? So um, they sprinkle EC3 throughout the episodes a little bit better. So that'll do it for me. Uh, hitting up the 20 minute mark at this point. I'm your boy BQ. And we'll be back again talking NWA power next week. Thanks for tuning in. I'm out. Peace.